So we're really delighted you're here today. My name is Kirsten Showquist. I'm the Director of Experience and Engagement at IONS, and I'll be your host today. So today's webinar is incredibly special for me. I first crossed paths with Robert and his work several decades ago, sometime in the mid-90s, we think. Um, I'm a huge proponent of his work, in part because he does such a beautiful job of exploring the world of lucid dreaming from a deeply spiritual and transformative perspective, but is also completely grounded in what we know about this domain from scientific research. And about six months ago, I was rereading his first book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, and it suddenly struck me how aligned Robert's work is with ION's guiding hypothesis. Some of you may know that, but it states, everything is interconnected, by embodying an awareness of this interconnection, we can tap into information and energy not limited by space and time and profoundly amplify transformation, innovation, and well being. We've been testing this hypothesis at IONS through uh, various experiments and publishing peer reviewed papers for 47 years now. And as you'll hear in today's presentation, transformation, innovation, and well being are hallmarks of the lucid dreaming experience for many. There is example after example of how people use this unique state of consciousness to access information and energy not limited by space and time. And Robert's work in particular demonstrates the the potential uh, lucid dreaming has to help us recognize and access our deep interconnection with a greater awareness. So uh, when our friends at Glidewing offered to partner with us in presenting their production of Robert's Lucid Dreaming Workshop, we couldn't say yes fast enough. Um, I'll share a bit more about that workshop later. And I think you're going to find today's webinar simply packed with interesting and useful information about the potential of this noetic practice. So Robert Wagoner has been a lucid dreamer since 1975 and has logged more than a thousand lucid dreams. He's the past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And for the past 10 years, he's been the co-editor of the online magazine, The Lucid Dreaming Experience, the only ongoing publication devoted specifically to lucid dreaming. His first book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, has been hailed as a classic by lucid, experienced lucid dreamers. And uh, his latest book, Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, Tips and Techniques for Insight, Creativity, and Personal Growth, written in collaboration with Caroline McCready, was called The Perfect Book for Beginners by EasyLucidDreaming.com. So welcome, Robert. It is such a pleasure to have you here with us today. And please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten. And uh, my thanks to IONS for hosting this event today, uh, this webinar, because uh, lucid dreaming is something that I think has such incredible potential to give us a new view of the self and expand that view of what the self is about and also what the nature of reality is about. So um, I'm going to have uh, Dom uh, forward uh, sides. And so I'll say next. And so I just want to get into what a lucid dream is. And so this is the American Psychological Association dictionary definition that a lucid dream is a dream in which the sleeper is aware that he or she is dreaming and may be able to influence the progress of the dream narrative. Now that's the dictionary definition, but most of us lucid dreamers would just say, a lucid dream is any dream in which you realize within the dream that you dream it, that you're dreaming. And so whenever you have that moment, it can be incredibly profound. You know you are dreaming the dream. Next slide. So think about a normal dream you see Godzilla, you realize that Godzilla is coming to take over. And so what do you do? You just react. You react to what happens. You create a story to justify it. Oh, he's come here from Japan and now he's going to take over. So basically in most of our dreams, in normal dreams, we lack any sense of critical awareness. 
we really can't judge or think things through very deeply. But next slide. But in a lucid dream, all of a sudden we think, wait a second, Godzilla, he's a fictional creation of Hollywood. Godzilla doesn't exist. Oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. So then at that moment, you've developed some level of critical awareness. You can then decide how you want to respond. So you could fly away, you could go up and punch Godzilla in the face, or you could do something even more incredible. You could ask Godzilla an open-ended question like, Godzilla, what do you represent? Or Godzilla, why are you chasing me? And incredibly in lucid dreams, oftentimes the dream figure will give you a response and tell you exactly why it's acting the way it's acting. But the important thing about a lucid dream is that you can seek insights, you can explore, and you can conduct experiments, both personal experiments and scientific experiments when you're consciously aware within a lucid dream. Next slide. So the scientific evidence for lucid dreaming uh, dates back from the mid 70s. Uh, the first one to really get it started was uh, Keith Hearn at Hull University in England. Um, he met a lucid dreamer named Alan Worsley. But Hearn was a graduate student and wondered, well, how could you prove it? How could you scientifically validate that someone was consciously aware within the dream state? And as he thought about it, he realized that in dreams, we normally have rapid eye movement. So our, our eyes are normally moving back and forth in the dream state. So he thought, what if he brought that lucid dreamer into the sleep lab and told him, when you become lucidly aware within the dream, I want you to move your eyes left to right eight times, and that will be such an unusual signature on the REM polygraph pad readout that that'll provide the scientific evidence. And so that's what happened in, in uh, spring of 1975. Alan Worsley came into the sleep lab and signaled that he was consciously aware within the dream. Now, a couple of years later, Stephen LeBerge at Stanford had come up with basically the same idea. And so he brought himself into the sleep lab and he signaled by using his eyes that he was consciously aware within the dream. Next slide. So here's an example from one of LeBerge's pa papers in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. And what we see here is um, the REM polygraph readout. LOC stands for left ocular and ROC for right ocular. And so you can see there as you look at LOC and ROC that in the dream state, the eyes are moving every which way. But suddenly in the second line there, you see a place where the eyes are now moving in synchrony, left and right, left and right, left and right. The person has become consciously aware and they're signaling their awareness within the lucid dream state. And then it goes to the third line there and they might be signaling, now I'm going to begin the experiment. And then in the fourth line, they might be signaling, now I'm ending the experiment. And then at the very end, they'll signaling, now I'm going to wake up. So this is called the eye signal verification technique. And this is how people came to understand that lucid dreaming was an honest phenomenon, that it was scientifically based, and that even though religious groups had been talking and spiritual groups and spiritual traditions had been talking about it for ages, that it was actually valid. And that, that's how we continue with today. Next slide. So because psychology has so many folks interested in neurology and the brain studies. Uh, I wanted to point out one study that was done and reported in sleep uh, by Ursula Voss and J. Allen Hobson and others. But this was back in 2009. They used the 19 channel EEG electroencephalogram and they put it over the lucid dreamers in the sleep lab to measure their brain activity. And so that diagram shows you at the top, the head that's so red, shows you that the brain activity while the person is consciously aware in the waking state. And the bottom is the same person when they're having a normal dream, that's the bottom. But the middle level, when suddenly the cerebral cortex, the frontal lateral parts light up is when the person has become lucidly aware. So you can see all three conditions, waking consciousness, 
lucid dream consciousness, and sleep normal dreaming. So these researchers called lucid dreaming a hybrid state of consciousness because it showed simultaneous activation of, of normal dream processes and the activation of the frontal lateral, lateral cerebral cortex. So really a fascinating study to see. Next slide. There was another study done by Martin Dressler et al. Uh, in 2012, and this time they used both an EEG and an fMRI. And uh, I'm just going to say, read off what one of the researchers said uh, after, but he said, from this study, in a lucid state, however, the activity in certain areas of the cerebral cortex increases markedly within seconds. The right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, to which commonly the function of self-assessment is attributed, and the frontal polar regions, which are responsible for evaluating our own thoughts and feelings. The precunctious is also especially activated and has long been linked with self-perception. So I just want to highlight that the person is lucidly aware, they have self-assessment, they evaluate their thoughts and feelings, they decide what they want to do, and they have a sense of self-perception of themselves acting within the dream state. And you also see it in the neurological data. Next slide. Now, some people wonder, well, well how prevalent is lucid dreaming? And in this study from the International Journal of Dream Research, um, they asked college students who were in psychology classes, have you ever become consciously aware of dreaming while in the dream state? In other words, have you ever had a lucid dream? In the USA, they found that about 71% of the college students said yes. In Germany, about 82%. The Netherlands, 73%. In Japan, 47%. And these are people who report having had or recalling at least one lucid dream. But when they ask if they had more frequent lucid dreams, like at least one a month, then about 25% of this group reported that they were having at least one lucid dream a month. So those are what scientists would call frequent lucid dreamers. Next slide. And also people wonder, well, is lucid dreaming natural? And here's a wonderful study by Ursula Voss in Germany. She went to a school system and worked with 694 German school children, ages six to 19. And she asked all of them, have you become consciously aware of dreaming while in the dream state? And of the group, about 51% reported a lucid dream. But the incredible thing is, kids as young as seven and eight year old were reporting lucid dreams. I think 20% of the eight year old students had already had a lucid dream. And here's an example by one of the young boys. I dreamt I was playing soccer with my friends. And when I looked at my legs, I saw that they were distorted. Then I realized it must be a dream. And he went ahead and played the soccer game. So you can see it happens naturally. It happens spontaneously. It's prevalent across the population. But of course, in our normal society, we don't talk very much about dreaming. Uh, let alone about lucid dreaming. And there's still a lot of people who have never even heard the term lucid dreaming. So next slide. So when I go around the world and, and give talks and workshops, one of the things that people often ask is, well, what's the value of lucid dreaming? Why, why would anyone care to learn to become a lucid dreamer? And so besides all the fun you can have in a lucid dream, uh, I, I think these would be some of the main points where you could value lucid dreaming. First, it allows you to explore dreaming. You can explore and experiment within the dream state, or you might say you're exploring and experimenting within the unconscious mind. And to see the principles and the rules and the guidelines of, of how that system functions is truly incredible. Also, you can enhance skills in lucid dreaming. There's been some scientific research on people practicing actions like throwing darts in a lucid dream and then waking and throwing darts again. And normally it shows some manner of improvement. So in fact, uh, there was a study in Germany that I believe 8% of the professional athletes use lucid dreaming to perfect their athletic skill. 
But besides enhancing skills, you can also access creativity. You can walk into a uh, building and say, lucidly aware, now show me the most incredible art I can create. And normally you'll see projected on the wall, incredible pieces of art that just instantaneously appear. People have used it to, to uh, take care of software coding programming errors and things like that. There's, there's incredible creativity accessible in the lucid dream state. Also, people can use it to resolve emotional issues, uh, nightmares, anxiety, phobias, and all. And some of that has some scientific backing behind it, especially with PTSD nightmares. And we'll get into that in a bit. What many of us have discovered is that you can also use lucid dreaming to improve your health or physical healing. And we'll get into that later and you'll see why I brought that up. Also, um, like my first book, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self, you can also use lucid dreaming to access an inner level of awareness. So for example, you can become lucidly aware, stabilize the lucid dream, ignore the dream figures, ignore the dream setting, and ask a question of what you might call your unconscious mind or your inner awareness. Like, hey dream, show me something important for me to see. And all of a sudden, the lucid dream will change. You'll be seeing something that's important for you to see. It's truly profoundly incredible when you have that. And finally, you can use it for its longstanding tradition as a technique to increase and enhance spiritual growth. And so Buddhist dream yoga has been discussed for almost 2,000 years now. It's lucid dreaming has been widely used in it and also in Sufism. It's been used in uh, shamanic and, and native traditions. It's been used in Taoism, and also there's yoga nidra in, in the Hindi system. So there's a whole range of how deep lucid dreaming can be used. In fact, I remember uh, Naropa, the 11th century Buddhist yogi, uh, he said that dream yoga was one of the six paths to enlightenment. And dream yoga, of course, is blending lucid dreaming along with the philosophy of Buddhism uh, to achieve enlightenment. Next slide. So I just wanna get into some of this and make it a little bit more practical for you. So back in uh, 1980, 1981 is when the scientific evidence for lucid dreaming emerged. And uh, it was in 1982 when a therapist reported using lucid dreaming to end recurring nightmares and some clients who had PTSD. And this gentleman, Gordon Holliday, was in Ohio. He had two patients. I remember one of them was a young man who uh, had been working on a tractor and it, the tractor fell on him and was crushing him. And so ever since that accident, he would have nightmares. And so Holliday said, look, you're having that recurring nightmare over and over again. Now at one point here, I want you to realize that you're dreaming and just change one thing in the lucid dream, and then we'll see what happens. So that man, he is having the nightmare again, and he remembered, wait a second, that's that recurring nightmare. Oh, and he stopped, and he instead of the barn being red, he turned it green. And when he woke, after that, he could fall asleep, and the nightmares had ceased. And so that's what you normally find when you resolve a nightmare by becoming lucidly aware and changing one thing. Next slide. There's a wonderful report uh, in the Israeli Journal of Psychiatry by Henry Abramovich. He had a client come to him who had not been able to sleep for three days because of these nightmares of being chased by a train. And as they talked, he realized that she had had a, occasional lucid dreams before and understood the process. So she, he suggested that the next time she allow herself to fall asleep, if she is being chased by the train, remember it's just a dream and become lucidly aware and so that's what happened. The client became lucidly aware as the train was chasing her and she looked around and she saw that there was a train switch. And so she threw the train switch and suddenly the train went off on a different track. And so she was free. And Abramovich reported that when she came back, she seemed a changed person and felt profound relief. And that's one of the beautiful things about lucid dreaming. Oftentimes when you have one of these kind of lucid dreams, you do feel like a changed person. Next slide. 
Um, in our magazine, The Lucid Dreaming Experience, uh, I interviewed a young woman named Hope, who was a mechanic who was working on a Boeing 767, and it broke free from its moorings, and she watched as it rolled across her legs and completely crushed one of her legs. So she's in the hospital for about six months. She had one of the legs amputated, but she said the worst thing was that every night she had nightmares. She said the nightmares were so bad that she hated to fall asleep. That's how bad they were. And she's at the bookstore one day and came across a book on lucid dreaming. And as she read it, she remembered that she used to lucid dream as a girl and would go around flying and having all sorts of fun. But now she saw that lucid dreaming could be used possibly to help. So later that week, she was having that recurring nightmare. She's being chased. And she thought, wait a second, I'm running, but I only have one leg. And at that moment, she realized, oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this same old nightmare. And now she turns, she faces the monster. She looks at the monster and waves goodbye and just flies away. And the result was basically after that, her nightmares came to an end. So that's a beautiful way to uh, resolve nightmares. Next slide. But I think lucid dreaming, because it allows us to explore the nature of the unconscious and, and dreaming, I think lucid dreaming could also help us with other mental and emotional disorders that, that you see here. And so now I want to give you some anecdotes of, of people who have used lucid dreaming to help resolve those kind of disorders. Next slide. So a lucid dreamer wrote to me and said that she wanted to come uh, to the International Association for the Study of Dreams conference. And she wanted to come, but she had a fear of flying. And did I think lucid dreaming could help with a fear of flying? And so I told her, why don't you try this? Every time you become lucidly aware, try to go to the lucid dream airport. And if you feel okay, get on the lucid dream airplane. And if you still feel okay, let the airplane take off. You know it's a lucid dream and you can stop it at any moment, but just try that. She said she did that. Uh, even in one of the lucid dreams, she shouted out, I love airports, I love airplanes. And she said after five lucid dreams of flying in a lucid dream airplane, letting it take off and fly away, she said she just didn't feel like she had a fear of flying anymore. And so when she woke up that final morning, she uh, told me she had bought a ticket to come to the um, International Study of Dreams conference. And in fact, she bought a window seat because she wanted to see if it was like her lucid dream experience. And so she flew to the conference. She reported no trouble. And she, she said she was stunned that she just had no sense of anxiety about that. Next slide. A lucid dreamer asked me, could lucid dreaming help with anxiety? And I told her, you know, it might. Uh, you could always give it a try if you want to. And, and so I suggested that she become lucidly aware, just ignore the dream figures, ignore the dream setting, and just announce to her unconscious or to her inner self or her larger awareness, hey, I want to be free of anxiety for one week and see what happens. Later that week, she became lucidly aware. She remembered this and she shouted out, hey, I want to be free of anxiety and happy for one week. And she told me the next morning, she sent me an email about it. And she said, I feel like a little girl. And I wrote her back and I said, well, what do you mean you feel like a little girl? She said, oh, it was only when I was a little girl that I didn't have anxiety all the time. And so you can see how this made a just immediate sense felt impact on her. She said she kept doing this, and a few weeks later, she had her normally scheduled appointment with her psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist asked her, what's going on with you, as soon as she walked through the door, because he could tell that she didn't have her normal sense of anxiety. And she told him, oh, in lucid dreams, I'm asking for the anxiety to go away. And the psychiatrist asked her, well, what's a lucid dream? Because he was unfamiliar with the concept. So again, I'm not saying that it's been proven. I'm just saying that this shows you the likelihood that you could possibly use lucid dreaming to resolve anxiety. Next slide. So this was a really interesting uh, 
situation. I, I got an email a few years after my book, my first book came out. And, and the young man wrote me and said that he's a recovering meth addict, that uh, he got uh, caught twice by the police and, and, uh, and they put him into rehab twice. And the second time he was in rehab, it was like for 90 days or something. And, and he said he was bored out of his mind. And he's at his drug counselor uh, person when he saw my book on the guy's shelf and asked if he could borrow it because he was just so bored out of his mind. In that book, he read how you could interact with a larger awareness just by ignoring the dream figures and asking questions of the larger awareness. And he became an expert at having lucid dreams and interacting with this larger awareness. And so one time he asked something like, show me something important for me to see. And the larger awareness, it's non-visible. It responded, would you like to see what your life will be if you continue using drugs? And he said, sure. And he said for the next 10 minutes, it was like a video of all the people he would hurt, all the damage he'd do to his own body, all the pain and suffering he would just cause all around everyone near him. And he said that when he woke up from that lucid dream, that's when he decided to just totally go clean. And in fact, he wrote me after he graduated from a community college, uh, he said that he knew that if he could graduate from community college, that would mean that he'd been clean for at least two years. And that would show how powerful this was. But he gave me some examples of his interactions with his larger awareness, and, and they just blew my mind. They were just incredibly powerful, insightful, just truly amazing. Next slide. Here's another example, and this one I'm borrowing from Charlie Morley. Uh, book, uh, Lucid Dreaming, A Beginner's Guide to Becoming Conscious in Your Dreams. So there was a young guy, Antonio, who had been to a workshop and learned about lucid dreaming and was pretty good at lucid dreaming. So he became lucidly aware that night and he was going around having fun, talking to the dream figures. But he noticed that there was this one woman who just kept following him. And finally, he turned to her and said, so who are you? And she replied, I represent your brain but do us all a favor and stop smoking. It bothers us. And so as a lucid dreamer, he had to think about how to respond. And he realized that he had tried to quit smoking before, but he'd always have cravings and begin smoking. So he responded, okay, then how about this? Whenever I feel like a cigarette, you make me think of something else instead. And the woman replied, we'll see what we can do. When this young man awoke, he had no interest in smoking. He, he could hang out with smokers and had zero interest in smoking. He just went completely done with smoking after this lucid dream. And so what I'm trying to bring up here is what if you could use lucid dreaming to help people overcome addictions? Or what if you could use lucid dreaming to help people overcome obsessive compulsive disorders? I, th I think by these examples, we're starting to see how lucid dreaming gives us insight into the nature of the unconscious and could really show us a way forward to helping people. Next slide. So what about physical healing? Can lucid dreaming affect or heal the physical body? Next slide. So I think there's a proof of concept here and some of the research done by Stephen LaBerge. So, what he would do is have a lucid action, a lucid dream action performed, and then see if there was any physical consequence. So for example, remember uh, how he would bring people into the sleep lab, tell them when you become consciously aware in the dream, move your eyes left to right. What happened? The physical eyes moved. Even though they're in a lucid dream looking left and right, the physical eyes moved left to right. So then he brought people into the sleep lab and he said, okay, signal with your eyes when you're lucid, and then clench your fist in an alternating pattern. Left fist, right fist, left fist, right fist. Clench them in this back and forth fashion and I'll have some measures on your arm and we'll see if there's any muscle movement. And so they did that in the sleep labs and he could see this subliminal kind of muscle movement in the forearms in a left, right alternating pattern. Next slide. In another case, he wanted to see if lucid dream activity would show up in brain hemisphere activity. 
So he brought Luce, lucid dreamers in. He asked them to sing while lucidly aware. So they signaled with their eyes that they were lucid. Then they would begin singing. And what happened? The right brain hemisphere showed greater activity, which is exactly what would happen in the waking state. And so then he had a group come in and he told them, okay, I want you to do math problems or count while lucid. And what happened? The left brain hemisphere became active. So again, we're seeing this physical result when people are doing lucid dream actions. Next slide. He had a group brought in and told them to change their breathing patterns in a certain way. And their physical breathing patterns changed in the way that he had requested when they became lucidly aware. Next slide. He brought in a lucid dreamer and uh, um, asked them to have sex in a lucid dream. And he had them all geared up with about, I think it was 17 measures, physiological measures of activity that would normally be connected with that having sex in the, in the waking state. So what he wrote after that study was, lucid dream sex has as powerful an impact on the dreamer's body as the real thing. Uh, of the 17 measures, 15 of them were almost exactly the same. Two of them were a little bit different. Uh, the heart rate didn't get as powerful and the breathing rate didn't get as powerful as the real thing. But again, the impact on the physical body was profound. Next slide. So he concluded basically that dream events are closely paralleled by brain events. And of course, the proof of concept is that lucid dreaming changes the body. Uh, lucid dreaming can change the body. So now we're gonna go into the idea of using that proof of concept when it comes to physical healing. Next slide. So some of this uh, begins back in uh, the 80s. And, and here's one example that was in the lucidity letter uh, by my friend, Ed Kellogg, who will be uh, working the workshop with me and Jillian Thetford. But in 1984, Ed uh, sought a healing because he was eating a shish kebab and managed to puncture his tonsil. The tonsil became infected. It seemed swollen and red. There were red lines down the side of his neck, if, if I recall correctly. He became lucidly aware. He affirmed for that area to be healing, to be healed. And within hours, the pain had largely disappeared. I, I think he said when he woke, he, he felt like it was 80, 90% of the pain disappeared. The swollen tonsils went away and all of that. So, so that was one of the first reports back in 1989 of a personal experience in lucid dream healing. Next slide. Um, Ed had a friend who had plantar warts and she could, she found it painful to walk. And, and she had been trying to visualize these plantar warts to go away for a month or two. And, and uh, she complained about it to Ed and Ed said, well, well you, you lucid dream, why don't you try in a lucid dream uh, to heal the plantar warts? Later, she became lucidly aware. She created a ball of healing light and put it over each of her feet, intending for the feet to be healed. And when she woke up, what she found was overnight, all the plantar warts had turned black and within 10 days they fell off and never returned. So again, another seeming healing occurred in the lucid dream state. Next slide. Um, a gentleman read my first book and the chapter on healing and lucid dreams. Uh, his name's Ray uh, Brannon. Uh, so he reported this for our magazine. He had GERD, gastroesophageal reflex disorder, and he had been to the doctors. No one could help him. He is taking medicine. It didn't help. He said it was so bad he had to sleep upright. And so he read my book and the chapter on healing and lucid dreams. So he decided to give it a try. Well, why not? He became lucid, he recalled his intent to heal, and he kind of came up with a affirmation, but he, he really hadn't thought about how to go about it. And so when he said he woke up, he, he said he felt maybe 10 or 20% better, but he didn't really feel healed. So then he realized that he had to have a better plan. So the next time he became lucid, he remembered that he wanted to heal himself. He asked for the dream figures to assist him with healing light came into his torso 
And he said when he woke up, he felt like a different person. He truly felt that the issue had been resolved. And for the first time in years, he began sleeping in bed because now he could lie down and the issue was resolved and uh, he was healed of the GERD. Next slide. Here was a wonderful story in our recent issue, the September 2020 issue of the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine. This gentleman, uh, Matthew Zinkar, he had eye pigment dispersion syndrome where apparently the pigmentation of your eye begins to flake away. It gets captured in the drainage duct and because it gets captured there, it begins to build up eye pressure and oftentimes can lead to blindness um, especially in young men's ages 30 to 40 or so. So here's what he did. He got the, his eye scans from April 2014 at the top, showing his eye levels. Then the dramatic decrease in January of 2020. And then the remarkable improvement that occurred after in a lucid dream on May 3rd of 2020, he intended for his eye to be healed. And, and so the decline, you can see it's a drop of about 10% or whatever. And suddenly from that drop of, in January, suddenly the eyes improve uh, seven or 8%. And, and so it, it's truly profound to see this kind of data, but it shows how powerful lucid dreaming might be and uh, in terms of healing the physical body. Next slide. And there's a wonderful story by Beverly D'Urso. She was one of Stephen LaBerge's main lucid dreaming research subjects. Um, in Waking Life, uh, a number of years ago, she discovered, the doctor discovered that she had an expanded uterus and a large cyst and a mass that looked like a tumor. And so he said, I want you to come back in a week because we're going to do some more tests. And so she decided to have a lucid dream and try to figure out what's going on. So she became lucidly aware. And the first thing she did was went up to a dream figure and asked them what they thought about her having an expanded uterus and a large cyst and a mass. And they basically just kind of replied to her, just kind of gobbledygook. So then she ignored the dream figures and she just looked up and asked, what does it mean? She asked what she calls the source or what I'd call the inner awareness or the larger awareness. She said, suddenly she began to see skeletons, ambulances going by, fire trucks, planes crashing. She saw this kind of death imagery. And so she really got a little bit worried that this might be a, a truly serious physical uh, problem. So then in her next uh, dream, she was semi-lucid uh, with her son. And she told her son, they saw these geometric figures of colored light in the sky. And Beverly semi-lucidly told her son not to worry that they came to heal her. And suddenly these geometric figures of light sent light down into her body. She began to feel it, the light coming into her. And when she went to the doctor for the next visit, suddenly her uterus was no longer expanded and there was no evidence of a large cyst or a mass. So within that week period, it all just came to a conclusion. Next slide. So I, I did wanna say that not only are there curative lucid dreams, but but Ed Kellogg's research on, on types of lucid healing also report examples of people getting diagnostic lucid dreams where they learn what issues they have and, and get that properly diagnosed. Also, there's prescriptive lucid dreams examples where within the lucid dream, they'll learn that they should begin to bring something into their diet, take something out of their diet, take a certain herbal compound, go to a specific doctor, ask for a specific test, and all that kind of thing. So there's diagnostic, prescriptive, and curative lucid dream examples uh, that Ed has developed. Next slide. But in my book, I also report that some lucid dreamers have used this and not had any success. And so I just want to give you an example of that so you can kind of see what happens. A woman became lucidly aware at the dream hospital and she remembered her intent to heal herself. But what does she do? She goes to find the dream doctor and she asked the dream doctor to heal her. And the dream doctor replied to her that it's Friday at five o'clock and you always come when I'm getting ready to go. And, and so, so she says, this is my dream. You've got to heal me. And the doctor says, okay, how about you start eating this? And she goes, I'm not gonna eat that. 
it gives me gas or whatever. And so he walks away. Then she runs up to the nurse and asks the nurse to heal her. And the nurse says, okay, why don't you start eating this? And again, she refused to take the uh, suggestion of the nurse. And so when she woke up, there was no change. So he, here's what you see in these kind of examples is kind of a, an external locus of control that the healing has to come from somewhere else that the person kind of believes that they can't heal their physical body. Also, when they get suggestions, they refuse them as being uh, not important or not whatever. They kind of lock, lack any positive expectation. So th that's when you see that, that uh, it's more complicated than just becoming lucidly aware and say, oh, now I'm healed. There's a lot of uh, psychological factors that come into play here. And also there's certain techniques and ways of approaching it that, that are good to know. So at this point, I wanted to stop and, and kind of uh, turn things over to Kirsten, because I imagine there's been some questions uh, that are coming up, and uh, we, we might as well take a chance here to hear some of the questions that I can respond Boy, to. Boy, howdy. Yeah, there are loads of questions. So there are quite a few that are about how one can actually induce and bring on a lucid dream. And a specific question is, are there exercises one can do to direct the focus of dreams before falling asleep? Right, right. So, so there definitely are uh, a number of ways to become lucidly aware. There's probably... 20 different uh, techniques that people can use in order to become lucidly aware. Some of them are as simple as the power of suggestion. Just telling yourself, tonight in my dreams, I'll be more critically aware. And when I see something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming. And so you just repeat that over and over. Tonight in my dreams, I'll be more critically aware. And when I see something strange, I'll realize I'm dreaming. And then when you see something strange, all of a sudden you think, wait a second, that's way too strange. Oh, this is a dream. But there's a whole set of ways uh, to go about it. And uh, of course, I, I talk about those in, in some of my uh, workshops and all. What's another question there? Great. Well, you actually answered the next two with that one. Someone <laughs> was asking about, does attitude affect it? And can you set intention? So thanks for, for hitting all of those. Um, uh, several people have said it used to be easy for me to have lucid dreams. And now it's I can't do it anymore. Right. You know, I, I've met a number of people uh, who report the same thing. And, and here's some of the interesting things I've realized. So some people, it's, they used to be great lucid dreamers, but then they got a very high powered job and now they don't lucid dream anymore. In fact, they don't remember any of their dreams. And so sometimes it's just changes in life that we're too busy. We don't remember our dreams. We're not getting lucid. But sometimes what happens is People are still remembering their dreams. They haven't had a change in life, but they're not having lucid dreams. I'll often ask them to go back to that last lucid dream they had and see if in that last lucid dream, there was anything that frightened them. Because sometimes if we get afraid, then we stop the behavior. Or I'll ask them in that lucid dream, was there any suggestion that you should change? Because sometimes when our larger awareness suggests to us that we should change, oh, we don't want to hear that. Our ego runs away from that. And so sometimes when you resolve those issues of what was ever, whatever that issue presented in that last lucid dream, if you resolve it, then your lucid dreaming will naturally return. But oftentimes there's things like that. And in some rare, rare instances, there's people who are taking prescriptions and and actually the drugs they're taking are inhibiting their dream recall. Great. Well, that actually is a whole nother set of questions. So there were um, several questions that were talking about things that one can take to induce um, lucid dreaming, the vitamin B12, galantamine. And then someone else was asking, um, are, there, are there medications that maybe could get in the way of it and acetaminophen, aspirin, that sort of thing? Right. Uh, in, in some medications, you'll see in the uh, side effects, you'll see may result in a lack of dreaming, or it may result in vivid dreams. Uh, so so you, you should always look at the side effects of whatever medications you might be taking. Um, sometimes people take B, B vitamins to help with memory processes, and they might take it before they go to sleep in order to make it easier to recall their dreams. And, and part of being a lucid dreamer, of course, is having good dream recall. 
So, so, so that uh, seems like a fine idea. Uh, there are some herbal supplements um, like galantamine, uh, which comes from the lily family. And it's one of the uh, active ingredients in some Alzheimer drugs to help people with Alzheimer kind of be here now to, to be more focused in this waking uh, state. But I want to tell you, glantamine is a pretty powerful herb. And, and so uh, I, I'll talk about it in my workshop. But right now, it's, it's kind of complicated to get into uh, because it does. So it's no longer like you're having a natural lucid dream. You're having a little bit of a chemically influenced lucid dream is, is what I'm trying to get to. So sometimes people who take glantamine report kind of more fantastical uh, lucid dream settings, sometimes greater stability, but sometimes they'll lack kind of their cognitive process. They won't think, oh, I'm having this incredible lucid dream that's going on and on, but they never think of anything to do. And, and so it's a kind of very shallow, long lasting lucid dream. So, so all these things have their own effects. Uh, other Great. questions? And yeah, there's a whole series of questions also around um, precognition and other psi phenomena, which of, of course is very, very close to what we do here at IONS, particularly relating to the guiding hypothesis and accessing information beyond space and time. So what can you say about that? Right. So, so um, in my first book, I have an entire chapter on, on uh, getting information uh, outside of normal linear time by lucidly aware seeking out forward information. And, and it's, it's quite interesting to see some of the things because th there was that one uh, gentleman, um, Rupert Sheldrake, who, who wrote about morphic fields. And I remember in some lucid dreams, I would become lucidly aware when I would see something, I'd be in my hometown and I'd see a parking lot where I knew there wasn't a parking lot and I'd become lucidly aware. But what would happen three years later, they built a parking lot at that exact spot exactly like I'd seen that caused me to become lucidly aware. And, and so, so this kind of, that's kind of interesting, but also in lucid dreams, yeah, there's a lot of examples of people who have sought out uh, forward looking information and, and wakened with it. Also, there's lots of examples of people becoming lucidly aware when they meet deceased dream figures, friends or relatives who have passed away, who give them insight into something that's going to happen in the future. And sometimes these things uh, come to pass. And so you can see again that lucid dreaming really shows us that by connecting with our unconscious, we begin to have access to uh, other ways of perceiving and kind of the interconnected nature of things. So how about one more question? Yeah, so um, let's do one more. And then I want to share a bit about your uh, upcoming workshop. Okay. So um, how can meditation be used? Uh, in this, this question was to increase frequency of lucid dreams, but are there other ways meditation can support lucid dreaming? You know, um, it, meditation in and of itself that, um, doesn't always lead to lucid dreaming, but the best approach to meditating would be to meditate at four o'clock in the morning, wake up about two hours before you normally would and begin your process of meditation and allow yourself to drift lucidly aware into a dream. So oftentimes that's what they would do in like a Buddhist dream yoga monastery. But the great thing about meditation though, is that it helps with stability of mind because once you become consciously aware in a lucid dream, your awareness can shift. But if you have stability of mind that you've developed in meditating meditation, then that helps you uh, as you deal with this inner reality of the lucid dream. So that's a great question, though, and, and probably one that we could talk more and more about. But I'll let you go ahead, Kirsten. Great. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned, we're hosting a four-week online workshop with Robert Wagoner and his co-facilitators, Jillian Thetford. Um, the workshop is called Lucid Dreaming and Living Lucidly, Gateway to the Inner Self. And this is in partnership with our friends at Glidewing, who produced the workshop videos. The workshop is designed both for beginners as well as for those who have ventured far along the lucid dreaming path. 
It's presented via streamed video. So there's no set class time. You can view the presentations as often as you'd like for the duration of the workshop. Um, and we've also included four special bonus live sessions uh, with Robert and hopefully the other facilitators specifically to dive into participant questions. Um, and these questions or these sessions will be recorded for those who can't attend live. So if you'd like to explore the power and potential of lucid dreaming in your own life, we do hope you will join us. So Robert, do you want to continue along with your slides and then it will break again for questions at a good yeah. point? Yeah, let's do. Let's let's keep going. And, and then at the end, we'll, we'll probably have 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So please move over to the slide set. And, and I noticed some of the comments of people who have meditated in lucid dreams. And so uh, in my second book, uh, I have an entire chapter on meditating within a lucid dream. So we want to go to the next slide. So, so in that workshop, we're going to talk about living lucidly. And, and what I mean by that is taking the insights from what you discover in lucid dreaming and bringing it into the waking state to, to assist you there. For example, you know, I've seen numbers of people who have healed themselves uh, by virtue of a lucid dream, but you can also transfer that same idea to the waking state. So I'll, I'll just give you an example of how that would work. So for example, um, I had hay fever every August, September, here where I live, I, my sinuses would fill up, I'd be sneezing all the time, I could barely sleep, it was horrible. And I just began to hate August, September when the hay fever would appear. But all of a sudden, after I wrote my first book, I thought, well, wait a second, I'm telling people you can use your mind, you can use lucid dreaming to heal yourself. Well, what about doing this in the waking state? And so this is what I did. Every time I would start to fear August and September or fear hay fever, I would stop myself and then I would tell myself, not this year. And then I would tell myself what I wanted my unconscious to hear, that this year I'm going to breathe easily and naturally. So I'd recognize it, I would stop it, not this year, and I'd tell myself what I wanted. This year I'm going to breathe easily and naturally. And so I'd see a TV commercial about hay fever allergies and I'd say, nope, not this year, not gonna worry about it. This year I'll breathe easily, naturally. The first year I would say I reduced the symptoms by 70%. The second year I reduced the symptoms by 95%. And now I don't even think about it. I, I just got rid of hay fever, this allergy, by using what I'd learned in lucid dreams about the importance of belief, expectation, your focus, your intent. And so that's how you use lucid livingly to uh, change your waking life uh, along with lucid dreaming. Next slide. So just to tell you uh, how I started, if you can imagine this, uh, back in 1975, I was in high school and I was reading a book by Carlos Castaneda, who was a UCLA, UCLA graduate student who in anthropology who wanted to study psychoactive substances. And so, Castaneda went down to Arizona, hoping to meet a, a native shamanic teacher to teach him about psychoactive substances. So in this book, his shamanic teacher, Don Juan, tells Carlos that he should try to find his hands in the dream state and become aware of dreaming. And, and I'm reading that thinking, can you do that? Wait a second. And I, I'm looking for the technique, but there really wasn't a technique. And, and so this is what I did in order to have my first consciously induced lucid dream. Each night before I'd go to sleep, I, I knew about the power of suggestion. And so I'd look at my hands while telling myself, tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. And I would just repeat that over and over as I looked at my hands. I just repeated it in my mind and then I'd fall asleep. And when I'd wake up, I'd try to remember my last dream, see if I'd seen my hands. On the third night of doing this, I'm walking through my high school hallway and my hands suddenly just pop up right in front of my face. And I thought, oh, my hands. Oh, this is a dream. 
And it was so incredible to realize that those school kids over there, hey, they're, they're dream figures. And this wall that just feels so cool and nubby, it's, it's dream stuff. And, and I went on to have an incredible lucid dream. But the great thing about this was that this happened in 1975, the spring of 1975. And it gave me about five years to study lucid dreaming on my own before people started talking about it and the scientific evidence came out. And so I began to learn the rules and the principles and the guidelines of lucid dreaming. Next slide. But, but when I talk about lucid dreaming to other people, sometimes there was resistance to lucid dreaming because people said, oh, you, you control your dreams. Oh, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with that. And, and after a while, I realized that really you do not control the lucid dream. You may control yourself within the lucid dream, but you don't control the entire lucid dream. And the metaphor I came up with is the sailor does not control the sea neither does the lucid dreamer control the dream. So instead you influence things, you direct yourself, but you do not control the entirety of the experience. Next slide. So here's an example from a lucid dreamer. The lucid dreamer walked up to a dream figure and said, do you know I'm dreaming you? And the dream figure responded, how do you know I'm not dreaming you? And then the lucid dreamer said, well, look, uh, I can fly. And then the dream figure said, well, look, I can fly too. And they began to try to one up each other until at the end of the lucid dream, they sat on the curb and they couldn't figure out whose dream it really was. So again, that doesn't sound like control. The lucid dreamer can direct him or herself, but unanticipated, unexpected things will happen within the dream. Next slide. I, so imagine this, you become lucidly aware, and then you decide to fly through a wall. But now when you get to the other side of the wall, you feel surprised to see a castle and a white horse. Who created that castle? Who created that white horse? So again, that's why I like to think of lucid dreaming as a hybrid state of consciousness. Your conscious awareness is active, but your unconscious awareness also seems active simultaneously. So that happens without any sense of you controlling it. It just happens when you turn the corner or go through the wall. Also, sometimes people will begin to fly, but they'll get so excited they wake up. So again, there's rules and principles to lucid dreaming. It's a hybrid state of both conscious and unconscious activity. And so you can influence it and you can direct it to a good deal, but control seems a little bit of a, a big phrase to use. Next slide. Here is a wonderful uh, question that came to my uh, website, lucidadvice.com, from a young guy named Brandon. He, he wrote, hi, Robert. In many of my lucid dreams, my mom appears, and I don't know why, but she always appears when I might be doing things that are inappropriate or wrong. She just stares at me and makes me feel really uncomfortable. Even though I know I'm dreaming and try to get rid of her, she won't leave. Do you know why or have any suggestions? Thanks. So, so I think what's going on there is he's doing something that he knows to him at least seems inappropriate or wrong. And as he does that inappropriate or wrong thing in the lucid dream, his guilt energy starts to grow and grow and grow until his guilt energy results in the creation of his disapproving mom as a dream symbol, as an expression of his kind of inner guilt. That's what I think is going on. But you begin to see the unconscious processes that occur because now you can observe how your actions result in changes in the lucid dream. Next slide. So, so here's a lucid dream of mine. Uh, I found myself in a farmhouse kitchen in the Southern United States and the farm wife puts beans on my plate and, and I thought, wait a second, I don't live on a farm. I don't live in the South. And then it struck me, oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. I became lucid. So at that moment, I felt something behind me. And so I always have uh, advice to people that you should always go to the area 
of the most energy in a lucid dream. So I turn around and I see it's, it's a young black woman. She's smiling at me. And so I pick her up and I put her right in front of me. And I ask her an open-ended question. I ask her, who are you? Who are you? And she replies, I am a discarded aspect of yourself. So, so as the lucid dreamer, I have to decide, how do you respond to a discarded aspect of yourself? Next slide. So what I decided to do was if she had been discarded, she wanted to, she needs to be accepted. So from my heart, I began to accept her. And here's what happened. As I accepted her, she began to shrink. She got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I accepted her totally. And that's when she became light, this, these bits of colored light that flew into my body, into my chest. And they were so energetic that I, I actually woke up. And so there you can kind of see this cycle. Um, lucid, I focus on the area of energy. I find out what that area of energy is by asking, who are you, who are you? When I totally accept that energy, it becomes light and the light returns to the projector, which is me. So that's, that's when you see by changing your mind, you can change the dream figure. Then you realize that the dream figure is a projection of your mind. So, so that's an important aspect of lucid dreaming. You relate to things differently. You see them change. And that's a way you can come to a greater understanding or healing. But I want to tell you the rest of the story. When I woke up, I felt energetically different. And it was probably a week later, I realized that every day that week, since the lucid dream, I've been thinking, I should try to write that book on lucid dreaming, the project I discarded a year ago, because it was so hard. So when, so I believe that this woman represented the discarded energy, the discarded aspect of my writing self. And when I reintegrated with it, as Carl Jung might say, uh, then I had the energy to go ahead and write my first book. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. So, so since I was able to lucid dream in 1975, I, I learned, uh, over the next five or six years, just how lucid dreaming works. Then uh, the scientific um, information comes out, the research validating lucid dream. So now at least I can talk to people about it without um, having them worry about me. But in 1985, I was part of a three-year uh, lucid dream study group where every month we had a goal to achieve. And one month the goal was find out what the dream figures represent. And so um, I became lucidly aware that month. I remembered, hey, I want to uh, find out what the dream figures represent. I went up to a dream figure and I asked him, excuse me, what do you represent? And I thought he would just tell me. But instead, a voice high above boomed out a partial response. And, and so I, I looked up into the sky and said, blah, 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 what? And then it responded with the full response of what the dream figure represented. And I thought, okay, I've met the goal. I'm going to wake up and write this down before I forget. But the next morning, I began to think, why, what was that voice that boomed out the response? Is there an awareness behind the dream? And so for the next uh, many number of years, uh, frequently in lucid dreams, I'll stop. And instead of interacting with the dream figures, I'll shout out questions to the awareness behind the dream. And it's truly profound. You can ask to experience concepts. You can ask to, like one time I asked, show me my life as if it was a painting. And suddenly in the lucid dream in the sky appears a 80 foot by 30 foot painting. That's my life. And it happened in just microseconds. So you have to think of the amount of creativity it would take to have a, a pictorial representation of your life suddenly appear that quickly. When you begin to interact with this larger awareness, it's, it's truly profound. And there's wonderful stories of people uh, making requests of the larger awareness where it refutes their request. For example, uh, Pascal Ortain runs the big uh, lucid dreaming website, LD for all, 
one time they had a goal, find the beginning and end of the universe. And so she becomes lucid. She looks at a mirror, show me the beginning and the end of the universe. And suddenly this non-visible voice res responds, the universe has no beginning and has no end. The universe is an everlasting cycle. And so again, you see that the non-visible awareness refutes her assumption and, and takes it from there. So, so that's how wild this can be. Next slide. But in, in lucid dreaming, there's this whole deep spiritual tradition. What, what I encourage people normally in lucid dreams, if they want to explore things spiritually, uh, one great thing to do, instead of trying to find a, a spiritual teacher or, or Jesus or Buddha or whatever, ask to experience a quality of the divine. Just look up and say, hey, let me experience unconditional love, or hey, let me experience one minute of samadhi. Sometimes the resulting experience is so incredibly powerful that, that really you'll almost be shaken by, by how powerful it can be. Next slide. Also, uh, as people have mentioned, uh, and I have a chapter in my second book, you can meditate in a lucid dream. And meditation, of course, there's different types of meditation. Uh, normally in a lucid dream, I would empty my mind and within 30 seconds have the most incredible transcendent experience of oneness that you could ever imagine. Uh, some people will chant a mantra and then it's like there's a thousand others chanting that same mantra with them. And there, of course, there's other types of meditation. Next slide. But the important thing is to see Lucid dreaming helps us expand our concept of the self. We begin to get in touch with this larger awareness, with what many of us might call our, our inner self. And also lucid dreaming begins to show us a, the actual nature of things. It's truly profound. So lucid dreaming helps connect the conscious to the unconscious and its wisdom. It begins to connect the mind to the body in new ways for health and healing and recovery from trauma. It begins to connect that, that little kind of ego waking self to the larger dimensions of the self. And, and also I think it allows the realizer to explore the depths of realization because th this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to lucid dreaming. And, and that's, that's why we do these 30 day online events. Next slide. So, I'll just end with that quote by uh, Carl Jung, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. And when you wake up within the lucid dream and realize that you're dreaming, then that gives you an opportunity. It's like a moment of Zen. It gives you a realization that now you can explore things and discover them as they truly are. So I think that'll give us some time for questions and, um, and um, we'll see where we go. Indeed, not not enough time, sadly, but let's just keep rocking. Um, someone asked, what is the difference in your two books? Which would you recommend for beginners? So um, the first book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, will, will show you the depth of lucid dreaming. It'll take you into all these areas, at, and it's the depth experience. The book, Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, is about all the tips and techniques on how to become lucid, how to stabilize the lucid dream, and then how to explore it in a thoughtful and rational way. Great. Well, someone says, um, is it possible that we're having lucid dreams that we don't recall because our general dream recall is poor? And someone else asked, how can I even begin to remember my dreams? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, you can have lucid dreams and fail to recall them. Uh, also, a lot, a lot of beginners have this experience that they'll become lucidly aware for a, for a second, and they'll be lucidly aware for like 10 or 15 seconds, but then it all seems so real that they convince themselves it's real, and then they just return to regular dreaming. So just the fact that you become lucid doesn't mean that you're gonna stay lucid. You, your level of awareness will change. And so you can forget lucid dreams or, or wonder sometimes, was that a lucid dream? But you were lucid for 15 seconds, but then you lost track. When it comes to dreaming itself, um, so here's what I normally suggest to people. If you don't recall any dreams, uh, tell yourself tonight, tell your inner awareness, hey, inner awareness, tonight I allow myself to recall my dreams. 
because sometimes we get out of the habit of recalling them. But if you tell your inner self tonight, you allow yourself to recall them, you might be surprised. Um, I've had people do that and they'll say it's like a slideshow of a thousand images uh, of the last thousand dreams. So sometimes it's just a point of focusing on it and telling your unconscious mind that you allow yourself now to dream again. Great. And what can you say about shared dreams? Right. In the uh, first book, uh, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self, I have a chapter on mutual lucid dreams. And, and uh, I'll, I'll share one that um, Ed Kellogg is probably listening. Uh, what, one morning, the phone rang in, in Waking Life, and I, I picked up the phone, and it was Ed. And Ed goes, uh, Robert, do you remember your dreams from last night? And I said, sure. Let me get my dream journal. I began to read them off. And he goes, that one there, that one there. So I sat at a table, and there's a person across from me, a person to my left and right. He asked, okay, the person across from you, and he began to describe that person in, in incredible detail. And I go, wow, Ed, that, that's incredible. And, and then, he, then he responded, oh, and the person to your right, did you discover a woman who was wearing a blue dress and had a flower in her hair and blah, blah, blah? And I go, yeah, Ed, that's incredible. And, and then Ed goes, um, well, what about the person to your left? And I said, well, I know it's a man, but I don't really remember looking at him. And Ed responded, oh, that, that explains how I can tell you your dream because I, I sat to your left. And, and it was truly a profound moment. But in that chapter, we, we provide some of the experiments we did on mutual lucid dreaming and shared dreams because they're, they're, that is possible. It's definitely, you want to be an experienced lucid dreamer before you take that on. Great. Let me ask one last question here before we do our wrap up. This is in response to your earlier example about the person with a meth addiction. Please talk more about using lucid dreaming to explore probabilities and options, i.e. choosing the reality you want to experience. Right. So uh, my co-editor of the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine, Lucy Gillis, sometimes in her lucid dreams, she asks to a to experience other probable selves. So, so imagine that there was a self of yours who didn't go to college or went to a different college or decided not to be a lawyer, to be a doctor instead or whatever. And she's had some fascinating lucid dreams of meeting probable selves who had probable lives that, that don't conform with her uh, actual life. And, and sometimes they'll share stories together. So again, this kind of shows how incredible lucid dreaming can be to kind of show you the, the multifactored nature of the self. Wonderful. Well, I wish we had time for more questions. We have so many. It really shows the breadth of interest in this. So thank you everyone for sharing your questions and, and uh, comments. And uh, do consider joining us for the upcoming uh, workshop if it speaks to you. I think we're going to have a lot of fun and have the ability to go even more deeply into some of these really juicy topics. So I look forward to seeing uh, many of you there. Robert, thank you for your time. Thank you for your incredible knowledge. And uh, we really appreciate you spending this hour plus with us. Well, great. Well, Kirsten, thank you so much. And thanks to all those who've listened. Uh, I, I hope that gives you kind of a flavor of the depth of lucid dreaming and how it can begin to connect us with that interconnected oneness uh, that we all share in. Wonderful. Thank you. Take care, everybody. And we will see you again soon, we hope. Bye-bye. <laughs>